Every few months, I check out what's going on at the Metrograph Theater in Manhattan's Chinatown. Since the death of MoviePass and advent of chain-specific subscriptions, I'm much less likely to make the trek than I was during its heyday. But every so often, I feel compelled to return to see some beloved classic on the big screen. Such was the case with Salo or The 120 Days of Sodom and Spring Breakers, too. A few weeks ago, Takashi Miike's audition was getting its own run, celebrating the film's 20th birthday. Unlike those others, this wasn't a 35mm print, but a full-on digital restoration, likely the same one used on the Blu-ray release earlier this year. I'd seen Audition before, but only in a living room, and certainly not in high def. It seemed like I should take the opportunity to see it big and in a room full of people, because I have become genuinely fascinated by how a crowd's energy affects the viewing experience of horror classics in particular. But there was something else too. I found Audition the same way I found Salo all those years ago, on a list of the most disturbing films ever made. But a lot has changed since then, and mainstream movies are getting increasingly vicious, and indie fare even more so. I wanted to know if Audition's imagery retained its ability to disturb all this time later. Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> Hello, by the way, and welcome to the Week Air Review. You can call me a guy who's fairly inured to cinematic violence, and today I'm talking about Audition. Years after the passing of his wife, Shigeharu Aoyama finally takes his teenage son's advice to look for a new companion. As a busy man who's been out of the game, though, he doesn't know how to do it. His film producer friend comes up with a scheme that in a post-Weinstein world feels especially problematic, they set up a casting call for a film called Tomorrow's Heroine, ostensibly offering non-actors their big chance to be a movie star. But Tomorrow's Heroine doesn't really exist. These auditions are for finding Aoyama someone to woo. And hey, it's okay because maybe they'll get funding and it will become a real movie. But if not, oh well. Aoyama eventually fixates on Asami Yamasaki, a woman far too many years his junior, half your age plus seven, folks, in large part because he connects with the dark heart of her story, a ballet dancer who, due to injury, was unable to continue dancing. She calls this accepting death because it destroyed her dream and the person she had built herself up to be. That her, at least, is gone. In my freshman year of college, I was living next to a girl. We had co-ed dorms because there weren't enough guys on campus to segregate even if they had wanted to, who had grown up figure skating. She had competed for years, winning trophies and basking in her own talent. But she hurt her knee, and that was the end of that. And she couldn't accept it. I would sometimes see her outside practicing her jumps, leaping up off the grass, spinning in the air, and landing on one foot. It was hugely impressive, even off the ice. But she was screaming into a hurricane. That part of her life was over. Aoyama reads this and believes Asami is wise beyond her years. The audition itself goes well, and so does the date that soon follows. But that darkness that drove him to her goes so much deeper than he, or we, at least back in 1999, could have imagined. I always go into these classic screenings assuming that the people there have seen the movie already and are looking for the theatrical re-experience. But, of course, that's never actually the case. Fans bring their squeamish friends and relations for a lark, or people who were like me a decade and a half ago but never got around to it finally have an excuse to catch up. Maybe some folks just buy every ticket that they can and have genuinely no idea what they're in for. Whatever the case is, there are always more gasps and yelps than I expect. And more laughs, too. Years ago, I saw a film called Soul Station. It is the animated prequel to the surprise hit Train to Busan, and it is brutal and bleak. And it's possible that you think Train to Busan is too, at least a little bit, you know, because of all those casualties. No, 
I was honestly shocked by how optimistic it is, and I've always assumed that Yun Sung Ho was told he needed to tone it way the heck down as his budget went up. His animation goes hard. The audience, though, seemed to have trouble reconciling that tone with the pretty low quality of the animation. It was objectively not funny, but folks were laughing anyway, and it made me feel weird. Laughter is oddly common during these things. This came up when I was talking about Solo, and though I didn't mention it in my Midsummer review, there was actually quite a bit of giggling during some of that film's more horrific moments, and I'm bothered when it's not clear why people are laughing. Some people laugh when they're uncomfortable, but that's not really what these seem to be. So do the people actually think it's funny? Because I'm not sure I wanna be in a room with them if so. In this case, part of it is likely the fact that Audition is a really difficult film to get into. There is an incredible sense of artificiality that pervades the entire thing. There is not a moment where you can really forget that you're watching a movie. Every location feels like a set, even exteriors, and the lighting is emotionally rather than physically motivated. Scenes slide in and out of each other, and it doesn't always make sense. It can be difficult to tell what's real and what you're meant to believe. Sometimes it feels a little bit silly. There's a reading of Audition in the Me Too era that this is actually a feminist power fantasy. Asami had an abusive childhood and ultimately, if perhaps unintentionally, became a punisher of men who transgress in their relationship. And she generally doesn't kill them. She leaves them maimed the way that she was, a piano player's feet, a record producer's ear and tongue. They too must accept death, but live without its release they will suffer as penance for their crimes. Aoyama's suffering is more complicated, though. He didn't do anything specifically to Asami the way that her earlier victims did. He promised that there would be no one else in his life when she asked. And when she breaks into his house, she is incensed by a photo of his dead wife, a slightly fair misunderstanding on Asami's part, and son, a massive misunderstanding on Aoyama's part. She believes that he lied to her, and she is not the only one in his life, and he's just like every other man. And here she is specifically wrong while being broadly correct. Aoyama is gross. He doesn't tell Asami that the movie never really existed, only that it's been put on hold. She thinks that he saw her at the audition and decided separately to pursue her. She doesn't know the half of it. And so we kind of feel like he deserves something especially since this isn't a one-off abuse of power, as evidenced by the employee we see a few times who caught unreciprocated feelings during an affair. Don't engage in intimate relations with people whose livelihoods you control, folks. However, it's important to note that while Aoyama is punished for his misdeeds, the man who conceived of the whole charade and facilitated it gets off fine. And indeed, Asami doesn't even know that he's complicit or that he warned Aoyama away because he felt something was off about her, which complicates the hashtag girl power narrative, as does the ending. That said, there is something interesting about having the deranged man who kidnaps and tortures victims character be played by a woman, a little less so now than then, and always a little more so in Japan than the US, but it's still against type. Outside of a dream sequence of sorts, we only see the horrific aftermaths of the others, but Aoyama's pain and Asami's methods are on full display here. But while the fact that millions of people seem to enjoy watching acupuncture limits the effectiveness of the imagery, Eihi Shina's performance as Asami is really the key here. The absolute glee she gets from pushing the needles in deeper as Aoyama writhes in agony is far more impactful than the needles themselves. I'm hoping that limb removal doesn't have quite the same popularity on this platform, and TBH, I'm not gonna check. But things take a turn when she pulls out some wire and goes to work. But not the turn you expect, because here is where folks started to laugh again. Because the performance goes from bizarrely sinister to just straight up 
bizarre as she goes to town yanking that wire from side to side. And again, this movie is built on artifice and that extends to the effects. The limb as it's being cut looks kind of fake, which is why it makes sense that there's so much emphasis on their respective faces as he is being maimed. You know, that's the real horror. But it's all so strange and over the top that it's hard to know how we're supposed to feel about the whole thing. By being confusing, it forces you to really think about what it is that you're watching, or more likely, what you just watched. And the images will stick in your mind as you try to parse through them, coming at the film from every angle, trying to decipher not just the events, but the fundamental intent. And you'll remember if you laughed, and what you laughed at. Was it abuse? Torture? And what does it say about you that you did that? And what does it say about us that in 2019, this movie feels tame? Nothing good. 8.3 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, that's great. If not, I'm sorry. If you want to see more, please subscribe. Next week, uh, I hit one year on this platform, and I have a whole bunch of stuff planned. So that should be fun.